Awesome. Let's get this online event started. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone to our online event. Um, actually, we can go ahead and maybe share our screen if you want to do this while people are arriving. Um, yeah. But welcome everyone. We're going to be covering a lot of great information today. Uh, financial planning for digital nomads. My name is Christina. I am currently based in uh, Ibiza in Spain. Um, this is where I'm calling in from this month. Uh, if you're just joining us, go ahead, drop an introduction in the chat. Let us know um, where you're calling in from and also how many years you've been a digital nomad or if you're brand new. And make sure when you're dropping your introduction in the chat, make sure that you are writing to everyone, not just the host and the panelists. I'll go ahead and drop those questions into the chat for everyone to see. Welcome if you're just now joining us. Um, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, we're gonna get started in just a couple of moments. Uh, one housekeeping thing I did wanna go over. Um, we'll keep an eye on the chat as we go through the presentation, but if you have any specific questions, we highly recommend dropping those questions in the Q&A box. That is uh, gonna be the best way to make sure that we see your questions so we can get them answered. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Go ahead, drop your name in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from and how long you've been a digital nomad. Uh, for myself, I have been a nomad for three and a half years. Gunnel, what about you? Um, I call myself a part-time nomad. So I've been nomading for about two years, but I'm mainly based in Amsterdam and London. I commute between the two mainly. Nice, awesome. Uh, and I think we have a lot of outside members who are not full-time nomads. So if uh, you're not full-time or if you're something more hybrid or you're just trying to figure out and design your best life, then definitely you are still uh, welcome in the outside community. We're not just for uh, full-time nomads. So, um, oh, nice, Montreal, Cyprus. Oh, hey, Ali, nice to see you here. Um, if you're just now joining us, uh, let us know in the chat where you're calling in from and how long you've been a digital nomad, or if you're brand new. And we'll get started here in uh, one more minute. We'll give a, a, a little bit more time for people to roll in. <laughs> How's the, the weather now in Amsterdam that you're back? I know you just got yeah. back from Bali, though, yesterday. <laughs> Such a big difference. So today it's been raining and cloudy, but it's just typical Amsterdam. Um, but I'm glad to come back to a bit for cooler weather because Bali was really hot and humid, but it's, it's beautiful. It was it was really nice. How's the weather? You in Spain, right? Yes, I'm calling in from Ibiza, outside Ibiza, actually. <laughs> um, so the weather here is quite nice. I've uh, uh, been doing some walks uh, in beach time as well. So it's been really nice. And a couple of members and myself, we went out for dinner and drinks last night. Uh, it, was, it was really great. <laughs> Ooh, great. We have some more answers here. Philly, Spain, New York City. Ooh, awesome. we have some new nomads. Awesome. Well, we have a lot of great information for you here today. Whether you are a new nomad or you're just, um, you know, you've been doing the nomad thing for a while, but you're thinking, okay, now I need to get serious. I need to think about my finances. Maybe be a little more intentional. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at on, on my journey. So I'm really curious to hear from you. Um, and just really quickly, a little background here. Uh, again, my name is Christina. I work for Outsight on our product and our community. Uh, I've been working with Outsight for over five years. I've been a digital nomad myself for three and a half years. Um, so happy to answer any questions about Outsight and um, our experience. We have over 50 locations around the world um, that are really designed for remote workers and digital nomads to really go set up their life, be able to work from these beautiful destinations uh, and explore in their free time. And we have one of our lovely members here today to guide us through some financial planning advice. Gunnel, can you give us a, a little introduction from yourself and then we can get started? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Gunnel and I'm financial coach and consultant. 
I'm so excited about this workshop and it's one of my favorite topics, um, favorite financial topics to discuss. I'm, um, let me just do this, yeah. So um, I wanted to firstly introduce myself. So I am um, a financial coach, as I said, and I'm based in Amsterdam and London. And I help normally individuals and small businesses, freelancers, as well as the digital nomads in unique uh, challenges they face and unique situations they have around the budgeting, moving around expenses, taxes, and so on and so forth. And throughout this workshop, I wanted to um, give you a lot more information about what digital nomad financial planning looks like, could look like for you, for your lifestyle, for your business needs, and also give you some tips and tools to navigate your financial landscape. Um, should we start? Or Let's we... do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it. Okay, um, so I am accountant by trade and I am I worked in corporate finance for the last 10 years in Amsterdam and London. My background is I, I went to university in UK. I have a master's degree in international accounting, financial management, but I'm also a certified coach and that's where my passion lies. Um, I love finance, but I also love working with people, making finance accessible, making finance simple and making sure you don't really live in a spreadsheet, but you are on top of your finances and achieving your goals. And that's why I created Huga Finance. Um, I'm sure you all probably know the concept of Huga. It means it's a Danish word, Danish concept, and means um, finding joy and happiness in everyday moments. So when I was thinking about a brand for my company, what I want to stand for, what I believe in, this word just resonated with me because it, finance is part of everyday life, isn't it? So why our financial lives can't be Hugo? So I want my clients, my people I work with to feel the same way about their financial lives um, like as, as they would feel about their personal lives, for example. So um, without a further ado, I wanted to move on to our agenda mm -hmm. and um, to show you what it looks like today. A lot of things to cover, a lot, and I will try to go through this uh, information in next 20 to 25 minutes. And I would propose to have, as Christine already mentioned, uh, have your questions in the Q&A box so we can discuss it toward the end of this workshop. And um, yeah, so let's get started with digital nomad lifestyle um, and financial planning around it. So um, being a digital nomad, it's such an incredible opportunity to work in new places, explore new countries and cultures, but it also comes with flexibility and freedom around the financial life and managing your finances can be can get extremely complicated if you are having, if you're not having a, an eye on it, if you're not keeping a control over that. As digital nomads, our financial planning should be always um our financial our our environments are always changing right we're traveling from places to places and so our financial planning should be adapting to these changes so things like uh travel expenses accommodation new visa costs and all the things come into play when you are actually going on this journey and having a solid financial plan having uh control over your finances can actually help you to live to leave your nomadic life more stable and have a peace of mind and making sure all your all your you making actually most of your nomadic lifestyle let's say that um today's workshop i want to i want to take you through some key foundations key principles that you need to consider when you become a digital nomad or maybe you are a digital nomad with quite a few years experience behind you so i think there'll be something to take from this something for everyone in this workshop and maybe a few things that you will want to consider as well if you're already a digital nomad. Um, we'll touch on budgeting. So let's start with, with that one. Um, budgeting. So budgeting is the foundation of, um, of uh, being a digital nomad or trying to be um, using this uh, lifestyle to get the most of your 
of your uh, nomadic journey. So the key elements of any budget I have put in, in here, a few of them are accommodation, phone, transportation, meals, um, some of the things that you can't really get rid of and you can't do without when you when you try to budget, right? So in your normal everyday life, you have to budget for those things. But when you are a digital nomad, um, there are a few more things that you will have to consider. So, for example, co-working spaces, new memberships, um, new visas, new permits, for example, and you have to also budget for those. And when you start the budgeting, I have added a few tips. Obviously, I think everyone here probably at some point done some kind of budget in their lives. So I'm assuming here that you know how to budget and there are, there are so many different types of budgeting that I'm not going to cover today because we have really limited time. But I have um, added some tips for effective budgeting that could be um, maybe some of these you'll be looking at and wanting to implement in your current budget. For example, I think uh, looking at the list, maybe lifestyle inflation, um, probably you all know or face this in some in some part of your journey. Lifestyle inflation is when your income rises, your uh, spending also rises with it because people uh, tend to spend a bit more when they actually earn a bit more. So being mindful of those costs when you budget it, especially when you're moving around, you're a digital nomad, you travel from country to country, um, same things could be cheaper or more expensive in different countries. So just be mindful of that when you're budgeting. But also I think really important to know that if you're a digital nomad and freelancer, and you may have irregular income. So trying to be a bit more conservative when you're planning your income and be a bit more, uh, mindful also <laughs> also uh, some months where you don't have um, regular income and try to spend less and embrace the cost saving techniques and strategies that could be really important um, another really important tip I would say um, always always include a buffer for unexpected things that can happen it could be medical emergencies it could be it could be some kind of cost that you didn't foresee when you moved to a new country and I would normally have uh, emergency fund that could, um, I would advise you to have emergency funds that could um, cover your expenses for the next six to 12 months. But also another fund that could be used particularly for some destinations or some of the things that you would want to use um, in the future. So, um, yeah. And Another thing I want to say, budgeting is not for life. It's not for, for five years. It could be always reviewed and adjust, adjusted regularly because we change we, 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 as we move through countries, as we move places, our maybe lifestyle, our, our priorities could change. So constantly reviewing maybe once a month or a quarter, reviewing your budget and thinking, uh, looking at areas where you could cut costs or you could... Uh, maybe change your financial goals, all of that is really important. So I'd advise you to come back to your budget. Don't forget about it when you start budgeting. It's really important to keep track and be on track with your with your numbers, let's say. Um, in terms of practical tools and techniques, I have included here a couple of things, maybe just to guide you and make sure that you are maybe give you another uh, thought. So there are lots of um, apps that you can use to track your budget. So I've included some of them that I, I know and I've used maybe. It's called Emma Money Dashboard Money Hub. They are really good if you want to just um, enter all your numbers on your phone or, or, or on a desktop. So you don't want to have any um, the, the, the apps really are helpful if you want to do that. And also now nowadays, lots of banks, they also um, uh, give you option to try the budgeting throughout your bank. So they give you, they categorize your expenses automatically. They show you different bars and charts so you can get understanding of your budgets. So those are Manzoo. Normally online banks now are really good with that. And traditional banks are also catching up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are so many other ways to budget. You can also budget on the paper, of course, but there's also Google Sheets or Excel if you want to start doing that. So I do my budgets on Google Sheets and it's very simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, you just write down all your income expenses and you, you get understanding of, of your financial situation. I also wanted to note here one other system, which is cash envelope system. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's very traditional, tangible method because... 
some people are really good spending, um, taking control of their spending when they actually see cash in their hands. This system is mainly, it might not work for everybody, it might not for, work for digital nomads all the time, but it's basically getting the money that you have budgeted, let's say seven pounds, and you have three, four envelopes and you put buckets of money to each envelope so for accommodation for travel for food so and you start spending from that envelope so it's basically called called um, cash envelope system so it's very tangible you can see where your money going and you can see where the money is reducing so that's basically that so um, just another option for you um, another thing to consider when your budget is um, there are some things that you will always have to budget for, if you, even if you don't want to, is <laughs> for, for example, taxes. So if you are earning, if you're a freelancer or you have your own business, uh, limited company, whatever that could be, you always have to consider um, your saving goals, but also your tax obligations, because end of the year or whatever, at some point in the year, you'll have to pay taxes. Um, and if you actually incorporate that amount uh, or that um, amount in your budget then you don't have to scramble at the end of a year or 15 16 months and find the money because you already budgeted and you save for it um other things are maybe future travel plans you may want to consider and and save for and you could start budgeting for those and emergencies obviously as well so emergency funds um other things that you think could come up um healthcare costs everything like that should be budgeted and um yeah, there are apps for it, as I mentioned, but you can also do on piece of paper. So there is no really a rule for that. Um, and again, I mentioned that having regular budget reviews are really, really important. And just to make it very simple, you can do it on a quarterly basis and you can always check your spending uh, with a previous quarter or previous months and always say where you can cut costs or where you can increase or things like that. It gives you really good insight into your lifestyle, but also it gives you really good understanding where your money is going. Are the money going into a lot of um, lattes or are you, are you actually spending them a lot of money on social media, for example, for your business? And, and yeah, things like that are really important. And the budgeting and reviewing your budget can give you insights for those. So um, next on, I am looking at time and we are good on time. So I'm going to go through the next few slides um, also quite quickly, but hopefully, um, yeah, you follow me and, um, sorry, I am going to move on. Right, so building and managing income streams. Um, here I've made an assumption that we already, if you're already a digital nomad or you're moving, or you're wanting to be a digital nomad, you secured one sort of income already, and in this slide, I in next slide, I want to mention a few additional sources of income that you could consider and diversify your income streams. And obviously, these are okay. There's lots of words on this slide, so I don't want you to read all of them, but I will go through them very quickly. Uh, obviously, one of the main income streams could be freelancing. So if you are really good at something, if you've got great experience in in certain field, you can offer your services as freelancing, as freelancer, and you can get additional money for that. It could be project based. It could be it could be every other month, but still, is it can be a really good income stream, and you can build up your freelance portfolio with that. And it could be addition in addition to your full time or part time job. So it is. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there for that. And another one is remote work. In, in the reason I put them separately from freelancing is because sometimes you can actually have your full-time job that is office job, and then you can negotiate your current job and to be sometimes remote or, or you actually you can move it to fully being remote sometimes. And therefore I put it separately, but also obviously there are lots of remote jobs that if you decide to leave your job or change your situation or country and look for those jobs that websites like remote.co, flex jobs, we work, they all have um, loads of ads about remote work opportunities and you can explore those as well. And next up is online consulting and coaching. So again, if you are, if you think that you could offer 
some certain experience to people, to clients around um, your area, your, your industry. For example, if you're an accountant or you're a finance professional, you could maybe do consulting or coaching and you can do those online. It's a great way of actually getting another income stream um, and, and that can help you to get the most of your digital nomad lifestyle. If you have more income, obviously, I always say to my clients that there's always a limit on how much you can cut costs, but there's no limit on how much you can earn. And therefore, yeah, this could be another way to increase your income. Um, another one is another one I put here is digital products. So this one maybe it takes more time to build up because you will need an audience, you'll need some client base in order to grow this and get some certain income over time. But this is really good um, place to be if you actually can maybe produce an ebook or online course or template, or if you're a graphic designer, for example, you can you can come up with some template and sell them on websites, online websites. So these things are once a lifetime. So basically you create them and you earn money as you sleep. So this is a great way of um, diversifying your income. Um, Next one and last one here I've added is virtual assistant. So recently I, I see a lot of digital nomads uh, among my clients as well, they are VAs and they actually enjoy this because this, um, this type of jobs, um, if you are good at organize, organization, if you enjoy planning and management, social media management, you can be a really good virtual assistant and that will allow you to work from anywhere and have a, another income stream in addition to your current ones, let's say. So we covered um, a bit of income and a bit of budgeting. And in the next few slides, I want to take you through the most fun part of the um, presentation and it's taxes and insurance. And it's really one of the most important, important areas of the uh, financial planning when it comes to um, looking out for future and understanding how and what you have to consider before you become a digital nomad. Um, before we go into um, further in this um, area, I want to actually bring up the concept of residency. And digital nomad lifestyle is so exciting and it's so appealing and it's great, but it also also, you also need to think about where you are resident. For example, if you're moving through country to country on a tourist visa, it does not exempt you from actually being a resident in one country. So most likely you're already a resident in one country and if not more for tax purposes. So if you are a digital nomad, it does not exempt you from your tax obligations. It does not exempt you from filing your income taxes on time. So understanding your residency is really, really important. And as a generic rule, as normally generally, is um, you're resident in a country where you spend 183 days in a calendar year. But now tax authorities, they also consider other things uh, when, when thinking about you as a resident. For example, if you have a real estate or property somewhere or family ties to certain countries, you might be actually a resident for tax purposes there as well. So I would really invite you to uh, check in with a tax advisor um, to understand your particular situation and understand also your tax obligation because you don't want to be um, fined or if you forget to file your tax return, you don't want to be um, fined a large amount of money just because you did not do your homework. So before becoming a digital nomad, for example. Um, in terms of potential deductions, when you are a digital nomad, you have additional things that you can expense to reduce your tax liability. And this could be things like co-working spaces, memberships, or VPN costs, or for example, all the equipment that you need, like laptop, laptop accessories, bags, all the things, or home office kind of equipment. You can expense all the things, but they need to be related to your business. They need to be directly related to your uh, business activities. So sometimes you may also be able to expense uh, travel, but they have to be also related to your client travel, for example, mileage to meet the client clients or go to a meeting. So um, those kind of things, um, professional association fees as well. If you're a member of any professional uh, bodies, you, you may be able to expense those as well. 
So again, please uh, consult with accountant or tax professional to understand your tax liabilities and also potential deductions when it comes to um, thinking and planning for tax as a digital nomad. And next up is health insurance. So obviously here, the travel and health insurance is really important and they can cover you for medical emergencies, trip cancellations, things that maybe sometimes you might, um, things that can happen and you may lose your uh, belongings or for example, if you're a photographer and you travel with uh, really expensive gear and it, ha it, it was stolen. So if you have a proper insurance in place, it can actually save you a lot of money and, and headache as well. So in, in terms of travel and health insurance, make sure you're covered for, for um, international travel or wherever you are in, in that country. So make sure your current health and travel insurance covers the countries you are traveling to as a digital nomad. Um, one insurance I wanted to particularly highlight, there's so many different insurances, but one of them I wanted to really highlight is liability insurance, because um, depending on your on the nature of your work, if, for example, if you're accountant or consultant or interior designer or graphic designer, for example, liability insurance can be really, really helpful and needed because it covers you in case of client disputes. And if some of the clients or customers are unhappy with your work or or potentially there are damages in your advisory or potentially on the client side, they're unhappy and they want to dispute or claim some money back. So if you have this insurance active and if you actually have this insurance, that can save you a lot of, um, also a lot of money as well. And also it makes sure, it makes sure you're covered um, in those cases. Now, um, investing as a digital nomad. So obviously investing is, I'm not an investment advisor. I just wanted to say in this part of the workshop that we are um, today, all the information I'm giving and tips and tools are just for information purposes only. And if you're um, if you're really interested in some areas and want to discuss it, please discuss it with professional, for example, investing, it will be investment advisors give you more information about the products that you can invest in. And in this workshop, I just want to touch on certain things that can help you to start investing if you're a beginner or tools as well, where you can look at and get more information and um, invest depending on your risk tolerance, for example. Um, some of the tips I wanted um, to include in this workshop are following. So um, if you're a beginner and you're not really um, you're, you've not really done much investing, how you can start is with automating your investments. So setting up automated payments uh, from your current account to your investment account and making sure every month you, you get some investments um, automatically um, through. And then you make use of the compounding over the time. It could be really, it could be easier to manage than actually um, doing it every other month and irregularly for example and this is actually a good very good habit to get into if you want to become a long-term investor in companies in shares in etfs um, and so on um, another tip i have for you here is prioritizing a long-term perspective what i want to say with this is when you're investing it's it's important and it's better actually to focus on long term and making sure that you invest in long term rather than um, gaining some short term advantages from market fluctuations, because on the long term, um, you actually you will you will benefit a lot more and your financial health could be a lot more stable if you actually focus on long term. So and also it's more sustainable. And I always say, do not live in a spreadsheet. So if you want, if you if you're an investor, if you want to do it long term, you invest and you forget about that investment for a couple of years. And obviously you look into your portfolio and you try to manage it every now and then, but it's prioritize a long-term investment and mindful investment when you when you start investing as a digital nomad. Um, another, I think this is more practical tip I want to give here is some countries they have tax efficient accounts. For example, in the UK, you have ISAs and there are individual savings accounts. So basically every year you can invest certain amount of money uh, tax-free um, with these accounts. 
and um, yeah, there are different, lots of different schemes and make sure you do a bit of research and read up on them and see what their benefits are before you start investing and um, investing as a digital nomad. Um, and another tip, I think I want to say, stay informed and also read reputable um, publications and website when you want to become an investor or you are interested in investing. For example, um, do not go and invest in things like you, things that you don't know about just because some costs are, are less or they're cheaper, the shares are cheaper. Do read about the companies you are interested in investing or the, the products you're interested about because there's so much information out there and uh, making sure that you're informed and making that decision um, once you're reading up uh, from reliable and trustworthy sources is really, really important. And do follow the trends as well. And sometimes um, you might be able to invest in companies that you never thought you wanted to just, but then, yeah, I won't say, stay informed. Um, on top of some tips, I wanted to also share some tools, how you start into, how you can get into investing. So I think the most important um, thing here to note is every country has their own, Sometimes there are main brokerage platforms um, widely known across a few few countries, but sometimes also uh, because of the regulations around investing, so every country will have some kind of online brokerage platform. So for example, again, in the UK, there's Hargreaves Lansdowne or Free Trade. In Europe, there's Box, where they are really into easy, they're easy platforms to get into investing and they're really accessible. They can invest in, uh, from like one euro, one pound. So um, do explore those as well as tools if you want to start investing. Um, in terms of um, tools also, I wanted to note uh, investment tracking apps. So if you have made quite a few investment and you want to keep track of those, there are investment uh, tracking apps. Uh, for example, Fidelity Investments, where they do... Um, they are mainly useful because they, they, they send you insights and market research information every now and then, which could be, again, really, um, really helpful when you want to understand more about your investments or maybe invest more in certain things or companies. So those tracking apps sometimes are really helpful in terms of research because it's all done for you. Um, okay. So um, I, I hope you found all of these tools um, useful and some of them maybe um, you have some questions about. We will move on to Q&A session in a bit, but before that, I wanted to invite you also to um, make use of Deep Dive Finance Coaching Sessions I offer. Deep Dive Finance coach, Coaching Sessions are tailored around you, your, your needs, your particular situations. And obviously in this workshop, it's more generic. And I've tried to touch on in a few different areas and to make it more generic around because uh, we all jo joining from different, different countries. You have different situations. Some of you are new to being the digital nomad. Some of you are thinking to be, for example. So in the deep dive session, we are actually going to co going over a few 13 uh, real-time questions that you have and try to cover those. And here, what I wanted to um, show you what they are, it's a one-to-one -one personal or business finance deep dive coaching session. There are uh, follow-ups after that, and, um, and they're also assessment before the coaching session. And for outside members, I also wanted to invite you to use the promo code for um, some discount and I would invite you to explore my services on hugofinance.com and there will be information about this if you want to. Um, Christina, how are we doing with time? Do we have some time for questions? Yes, absolutely. And we, we do have a, a few questions as well. And I just want to also say like, if, especially if you're beginning on your nomad journey, like really considering, you know, why you're doing it or what you want to get out of it. Are you trying to save money? Are you trying to live a more, you know, luxurious lifestyle? Or maybe you're thinking, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to reassess every month, every quarter, like, like you were saying, um, and being like, okay, I need to save more th these months so I can spend more 
in these next months. So I feel like it's something you're always kind of reevaluating and also like doing your homework, like you said, on where you're traveling. For example, I know a lot of people go to Central America and then they get to Costa Rica and they don't realize how much more expensive it is than the rest yeah. of Central America and they're, they're shocked or it, it really comes as a surprise. So I know that there's different destinations. Um, uh, so do, do your homework there to see what the reality of, of the pricing is. And yeah. we have a, a great question here. What is a good place to find a tax advisor or insurance policy for digital nomads? Often insurances are only for holidays and not work and have a, a time limit. Um, do you have any recommendations? I also have a couple uh, written down here that I'll throw in the chat as well. So the question is where to find a tax advisor or insurance policy. Is that is that two things, two questions or one? For me, they're they're separate. Uh, but 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 they're they're together in the same question. But it's um, right. I think tax and insurance is normally right. like separated out. Yeah, so um, I would say um, obviously Google it and, and LinkedIn is a great source to find uh, companies and people who offer certain services, but also you can see their recommendations. And it also depends if you are um, if you are self-employed or if you have a company. So it could be you, you, you mind different things, I would say, from the same um, in terms of advisory. So it could be also a different cost associated with it. And in terms of insurance, um, I think normally now um, all the main insurance companies, uh, especially in UK and the US and also in Europe, they do offer certain insurance policies for digital nomads with, with digital nomads in mind. And they would cover certain things, but obviously you also always have to check the country they cover. So some insurance companies, they all only cover Europe or they only cover certain areas. So, and they normally, the way they sell it to you, they, you might have an add on in terms of purchasing an additional country or additional region, because I don't know many policies that cover internationally if you're a digital nomad, because it's also a very risky proposition for them. So they need to know almost always where you're traveling to, um, for what kind of time, what, what, what are your needs. So based on that, they can build up the certain policy for you. Um, but yeah, obviously, as most of the times, it's not that obvious on a website. So you have to dig a bit deeper. And it's not normally called digital nomad. It's normally called, um, it, it's, it is based around work and travel. So you have to look out for those words as, um, remotely remote working and stuff they wouldn't be called digital nomad and also I just want to add here for like tax and insurance like these are like big and complicated right because it's every country has something different and this is something I really hope that continues to progress after the pandemic is countries and businesses realizing, hey, there's an opportunity here to improve this system for this set of people. Um, you know, I think Safety Wing is already like they've been around and doing this for a while um, and, and being able to make things uh, more accessible globally. It's just really hard to do whenever there's so many moving parts. I know even for Safety Wing, um, like most of their insurance covers a lot of different countries, but then there's like certain exceptions for different countries. So it's like, um, it's like you said, you have to look at all of all of the details. So it's not uh, as straightforward as just like booking, uh, booking an accommodation or something like that. Yeah. And in, in the same as health insurance, I think making sure that your health insurance covers whole world is really important. And sometimes, um, we might think that we want to save some money and just get the health insurance for a certain region or country, but then things can happen. You might decide to move to a different location and then you'll forget about your health insurance back home and then you're not covered. So it's really, really important to keep track of those things. Or you can just like set yourself reminders on your phone or something like to re review these things regularly as with your budget, for example, every quarter and just to make sure you're, you're actually covered. Yeah, and I think some of these insurances as well that I put in the chat, I believe you can do it on like a monthly basis and you can maybe choose the region that you're traveling to. I think this is more on like 
the, the travel insurance side. I'm not sure how it would work on health insurance exactly. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's like the wild, wild, wild west out there. <laughs> yeah. And, and Ali, Ali also had a great question here. Um, like when you are not a resident longer than like 180 days, um, within one year and you're really jumping around, like, what do you, what's kind of your take on that? Where would you, do you think it's worth just registering in your home com country or do you think it's worth it maybe to try and look at different digital nomad visas to take advantage of like the, like the tax breaks that you get there? What, what's your un unsolicited professional opinion? <laughs> Okay, it's a mixture of both. Um, okay, let's start with the first residency. I, For example, I see a question here, what's the difference between resident and citizen of another country? So you can be a citizen of country, but you can be a non-resident of that country. For example, I'm a UK citizen, but I'm not resident in the UK for tax purposes because I'm mainly living in Amsterdam and I'm resident for tax purposes in Amsterdam. That means I can work I can work in Amsterdam and serve different clients all over the world, but I am actually, because I'm resident here, I'm paying taxes here. But then there's also a different thing that comes in play. It's called double taxation. So you need to make sure your home country has double taxation agreements with the countries that you're resident of. Or also if you're traveling around and you're a digital nomad, let's call them host countries. Your host countries, for example, in Portugal, if you're going to Portugal for like three months and you are resident in Netherlands, but you're a citizen of UK, right? <laughs> apart from Brexit, let's put that aside. Apart from Brexit situation with a visa, you need to make sure that your host country has um, certain tax treaties with your home country and resident country. So it's a little bit complicated, but as you said, there are uh, digital nomad visas now, especially with Portugal. I think that's the best scheme out there right now where um, you can register, you, you can get the digital nomad visa, but it's really a, like a permit to allow you to live and work in Portugal. Um, um, and it's just very uh, easy to apply to and, and, and so on. But there are certain countries now they are doing this digital nomad visas because um, there are some risks associated with traveling around and being on a tourist visa and working. So if you get caught and um, you can be really actually fined because you are on on that you are in that country on a tourist visa, not on a work visa. And so it is a bit complicated, but um, I hope I answered your question slightly so you have slightly better understanding of that. So apart from actually 183 days, I wanted to say that's the gen generally how tax authorities uh, view residency. But um, as I mentioned, I think earlier, if you have property somewhere or real estate, uh, let's say in the US you, you own a few things and you are resident in Netherlands, you may still be liable for tax um, purposes in the US and also in Netherlands because um, you have to be really mindful if you want to do some investment also um, buy property or invest in a property abroad, you have to make sure you are not being taxed double or three, triple times in different jurisdictions because it can happen. Therefore, you have to optimize your tax planning a little bit beforehand before you make that decision. Yeah, and kind of related to that, Alexander has some uh, follow-up questions. Have you ever encountered a digital nomad that doesn't qualify as a resident anywhere? Um, do they have any tax ties in place or... Have you come across that situation? Um, yes, and again, it's it's a risky situation, and I wouldn't advise anyone to to do that because um, there are quite a few routes to go down if you want to be a digital nomad in terms of tax. So one is you just resident in your home country and you pay taxes there, but then you move around and you work. If you get caught again, you you uh, you can actually. Um, be liable to some fines. But then there are other roads where you can actually choose a tax residency in some countries where you pay, for example, less tax, less income tax, but you can be resident of those countries. And, um, and then you have to get a tax number and register yourself with those countries. For example, Romania and Bulgaria in Europe. I know a lot of digital nomads who go there, register themselves there. Um, 
but then that you can also you need to make sure so you tick yourself as non-resident in your home country otherwise you will be taxed in both countries um that's another route and then the third one is you are resident in your country, in your home country, and then you also apply for one of those digital nomad visas, just in case that you are you are covered from that perspective as well. Interesting. Uh, lots of lots of different things to consider. And as a follow up question to that, uh, if someone doesn't qualify as a resident anywhere, um, do you know any insurance companies that would I guess, ensure you like health and liability if, if you don't have like a permanent address to, to give to them? Well, normally, um, if you are, yeah, temporarily without residence in some countries, so sometimes your, your parents, where they, your parents live or where your previous address was, can, you can indicate that as your uh, last address or your last permanent residence. And you can try to use that as as a like billing address or as a main address that when you apply for the insurance or or healthcare. So I would advise that. So wherever your last residence, your last permanent residence was, try to use that one. But again, you have to you have to look into that situation in from all the angles. Um, trying to advise this is very difficult for me. But but I would just normally advise. Normally, the countries that you have family ties to or where you've um, you've lived the most during your life. So you can try to utilize that uh, in terms of healthcare and travel insurance. And I, I love this question from from Brett. I'm from the USA. How long can I stay in another country before they come after me for their taxes? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean US or the other country? <laughs> Um, I think uh, the other country, <laughs> the other, he just clarified the, how long till the other country that he's staying in comes after him for their taxes. <laughs> Depends on the country, I would say. Some countries are a bit relaxed in that. Um, they want you to come in. They want you to be a tourist, uh, to work and to spend money to contribute to the economy. So but then the countries and tax jurisdictions, uh, let's just say not countries, but their tax authorities are catching up on, especially after COVID, um, they are catching up on people moving around and having this flex opportunities, flex jobs. So I would say um, normally, um, because you have to file your income taxes once a year, right? And they give you probably a couple of months after the year has finished to come after a uh, certain amount of time, then you file your taxes. So I would say probably 16, 18 to two years. So you have to be mindful when you travel now and stay in one place for a long time. Yes, and I, I think even, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but um, at some at some border con controls, they're really, uh, uh, when, you, when you're going through customs, I've been asked like, how, how long are you gonna stay here? When's your flight out of uh, here? Yes. When's your onward flight? And if I don't have a specific answer, uh, they'll like in Costa Rica, they wrote 15 days instead of giving me the 90 days. Uh, wow. In Mexico, he saw my end date and he added like four days and that was the number of days I could stay. So I think they're also getting sometimes more strict whenever you're going through customs. But again, it just depends on the country. Like I just came back through Portugal and all they said was welcome back. So I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. I was in Indonesia and when I got there, they actually asked for my return ticket back because a lot of people now go to Bali, go to Indonesia and work from there and stay overstay their visas, tourist visa. They don't register properly for if they want to work. Actually, it's really easy to register there if you want to work as well. But lots of people just don't do that. And, and then they get into trouble. So actually now in the passport control, they actually ask you when you come back and you have to show them your return ticket. And yeah, I had exactly the same situations in Indonesia. There are also websites out there. I think if you just Google like $1 flight or something, you can buy a fake ticket <laughs> to um, show your onward or return flight. So if you do need to show something at customs, uh, it's it's easily accessible. So that's just also another 
tip for people. I've actually haven't ever had to do that, but maybe, maybe I will in the future. <laughs> That's good to know. One dollar flight. I'll check it out. Yes. Um, oh, well, thank you so much for all the great information. Uh, if there's any other questions we can help answer or maybe a topic that you want to know a little bit more about, um, we still have time for a couple of more questions. I'm just looking at Q&A box. Um, I think we've answered this once. What's a good place to find insurance policy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I guess one thing I just wanted to mention too, when it comes to the budgeting part, I, I use Mint and you can actually create your own tags. So I have my custom like categories um, and it's really helpful for me to see it as a snapshot, like what, what I'm spending on. Um, but then you start to realize you're like, wow, like uh, it, it, it really helps put everything in perspective, which is really nice. Um, oh yes, some great, uh, great questions here. Any tips on budgeting with inconsistent income, like a freelancer? Yeah, I think um, I did touch on this a bit um, quickly. Um, irregular income is obviously when you're a freelancer. I would I would say there are a few things maybe to take into account. I would be as conservative as I can be um, with my budgeting. So. Um, um, also, maybe sometimes you have seasonal jobs or clients, right? So if sometimes you're a freelancer, you might expect same client to come back to you certain times of year. So you might want to go off of that. But yeah, every month can be different. And um, in terms of budgeting for income, I would go as conservative as possible and adjust my spending as uh, according to that income as well for that month. So obviously, there are some things that you can't cut off. Um, as accommodation and food and stuff but every other things that you can have a look at your subscriptions you can have a look at your um, discretionary expenses where you can maybe push something onto the other months or or stuff like that so you can actually budget according to that month's income and I also see another uh, great question here in the chat where uh, what are some companies you recommend for liability insurance for your own business um there are a few companies in uk so there is um a company called um i forgot the name of now they're just like stand for <laughs> letters bpa can't remember now <laughs> I actually bought the insurance of them, but there's a, in the UK, for example, there's a um, website called moneysupermarket.com. And if you go there, it's basically a comparison website and you go there and it shows you a lot of different products and companies that offer what you want. And then you can go and without going to their websites, individual websites and getting bogged down in all that information, you can actually go to the comparison. It's, it's a bit like Skyscanner, basically for insurances. Um, and I'm sure there's something like that in the US as well, where you can just go into, into that website. And if you just Google it, you'll probably find it. But moneysupermarket.com is the main one for UK and Europe. And you can find the different insurance policies and what they cover and what they don't cover and how much they cost. And there are personal like insurances as well. And then there's business liability insurances as well. And I would highly, highly rec recommend getting liability insurance um, as soon as you start your business, if you're a consultant or graphic designer or yeah, any sort of like where you work with a client, um, I would say get one as soon as possible. It's as important as your healthcare and travel insurance, I would say. Definitely. And kind of a, a great follow-up question to that is what are the most common countries you help your clients with to set up their tax residency and their company in? So um, I don't help with tax residences or tax issues because I'm not a tax advisor. But I have a great network of um, people that I know in my network. There are tax advisors, there are accountants and their bookkeepers. They actually do that. They specialize in that particularly. Main countries would be UK and Europe. 
but I can also, because of my network, I have access to all other advisors as well. I can help um, because I have a lot of expats in Netherlands. That are, they are my clients, but from financial coaching perspective, but they are US citizens and they work here. They have to file uh, taxes in Netherlands and in the US. So those kind of things, I do refer them to my contacts and my referrals um, and they can advise them um, more specifically. And I think we're getting a lot of a lot of tax questions here. So this is <laughs> great inspiration for us to do a, a tax event oh, in the future. We have yeah. them, like a couple of them in the past, but we do we do space them out. So maybe now now is the time because everyone's uh, it's on everyone's mind. So thank you everyone for the great uh, set, uh, questions. <laughs> and I love this question too from Alexandra. Would you say that there is a point where you can financially relax as a freelancer? I think uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I like it. Um, I think again, um, for me, um, being financially relaxed it depends on your values and your principles and where you want to be and for some people achieving a certain amount of money let's say 100k or 250k whatever that number is for you is is the point where they think okay i've done it i've made it i can now relax but for other people it's actually just the beginning so it really depends on you and where your values are for example and also your minimum spending uh sorry your um monthly spending or how you spend where you spend and how much money do you actually need because most of people I think I know they say oh if I won the lottery if I had this month this max of money amount of money I would be so happy but do you actually need that much of money and and I think that question if you think about your what the amount of money you require to leave and to live, happily leave and do all the things you want and then that will dictate how much how many clients you want to take on how many jobs you want to do do you value your work-life balance? All sorts of, all the things around it is really important, but it all derives from the, the, the question that you need to ask yourself where you want to be um, now, five years from now, 10 years from now, stuff like that. Obviously, you don't have probably answers to all of that, but right now, um, I think relaxing as a freelancer, I know it's um, because of irregular income or because certain complexities around moving around and expenses, it can be quite quite complicated but if you plan accordingly especially financially then you can get to the point where um you can do that more stable and more sustainable as well with less spreadsheets <laughs> all right i think we have time for maybe one more question um before we head out we want to be mindful of everyone's time but thank you so much for all the great information that you shared here. And I know we dived into some specific questions as well. So uh, thank you for your, your feedback there. We're also going to be sharing this recording with everyone after the event. So you can still have it to go back and see the slides, uh, review any of the information we went over. Um, but yes, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we can wait one more minute to see if any other questions come in. Ooh, here's a, another good one. How do I take advantage of international investment tax breaks? Um, like, for example, in Puerto Rico, maybe there's no capital gains. Um, what does this kind of look like from your perspective? So, um, you... <laughs> To take advantage of those tax breaks, that means um, you you have to again follow certain rules, and you have to be you have to make sure you need you live in those in that country um, or res, uh, jurisdiction legally. So you have to have a particular or a specific permit. It's, it's same in Portugal, for example, or a few other countries where they do this digital nomad. Um, visas or permits so making sure that you are in the country uh, legally and once you're there legally and you 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 spend a certain amount of time there let's say one month or three months um how, however once you get that permit they will actually tell you how much money you have to, uh, sorry how much time you have to spend in that country and based on that when you file your tax return you indicate the amount of time probably from start to end time and um, how much you've earned in that country and abroad. And then that's how in your tax return it will be calculated. 
So you can't really do it until you really you file your tax return after a calendar year is finished or, or your business is uh, financial year. So it could be different. So your personal uh, tax year is like, normally it's calendar year, but in UK it's March, April to March. But your business financial year could be different. So you might have to file two tax returns, one for personal, one for business. And it could be different end start dates and stuff like that. So yeah, you have to um, plan for that as well. <laughs> yes, and I feel like um, for a lot of people I know who are doing more like digital nomad visas and such, um, most people have said it's really advantageous to actually have like a lawyer or an advisor there to help um, make sure everything is in alignment uh, and, and keep you on the right track, especially because some of these countries, when it comes to paperwork and stuff, it's like things can get lost in the system or they take forever. So it's really nice to have someone uh, there in the process with you. Yeah, definitely. I would say work with advisor. Um, and it probably is something that you'll have to go back once a year um, or once or twice a year to just check in and once to file the tax return. But those few hours that you invest and spend with that advisor, it can cost you, it can actually give you a lot of benefits and no headache. So I would definitely advise to find a tax advisor in the same country. Nice. Well, thank you everyone for all your wonderful questions and for joining us today. And thank you so much to our expert here uh, for sharing all your knowledge. Um, we'll share her information again. It's right here on the screen, but we'll also send it in our follow-up email as well. So you have it right there so you can connect with her more deeply. Um, thank you everyone again for joining us and we hope to see you online at the next one, maybe a tax event as well. Um, I also do want to shout out for anyone who is in London, July 11th, we're having an outside happy hour uh, at uh, one of the parks. And then also uh, July 20th, we're having uh, another outside happy hour in Austin, Texas. So uh, if you're around, we'd love to see you in real life uh, at either of those locations. Wonderful. <laughs> All okay. right. Ciao, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.